All right, I got the thumbs up from Anthony. Um, so, um, Dr. Maria Anderson is here with us today um, to present Facing the Future of Technology and Learning. Um, I'm very excited to, to have her here. She is the uh, CEO of Course Tune, and um, I'm, I'm going to ask her to come up and, and uh, tell us a little bit more about herself. And I want us to give her a very warm welcome. She came from Utah, I believe. Um, and uh, we're just very excited to have you here and to see your presentation. Thanks. I'm just going to dive into the presentation, and you'll learn a little bit about me along the way, I think. Um, the presentation is completely online, too, so you can find the slides there in case you need to go back to something. I wanted to start by just trying to drive home just how much the world has changed in the last 10 to 15 years. I think in education, we sometimes are maybe not sometimes, we're often the boiled frog and don't realize that things have changed around us until it's maybe too late and we've been boiled. So this was what uh, the world looked like outside of St. Peter's Basilica when Pope Benedict uh, was elected in uh, 2005. This is the world in 2013 when Pope Francis was elected. That's a difference of eight years. And that picture was seven years ago. Did you know that the average American now looks at their phone 80 times a day? <laughs> That's an average. <laughs> so that includes teenagers who probably look about 200 to 300 times a day and folks who use their phone less, who, who clearly look less. I wanted to show you just how fast this change happened in the United States. So this is the number of smartphone users in the United States in millions. And um, when you get to this point right here on the graph, that's the 2020 estimate for smartphone use in the United States. That's 268 million people using smartphones. Uh, who remembers what the current population of the United States is? Anyone? 330-ish, yeah. It's, about, it's according to Google, uh, about a month ago, it was 327 million. Um, and of that 327 million, about 12% are below the age of 10, so they might not have phones yet, emphasis on might. Um, and 16% are above the age of 65 and probably have a lower, definitely have a lower use of smartphones than the rest of us, which leaves probably about 277 million who will use a smartphone. And we are currently at, uh, according to that graph, about 268 million, which means we almost have the entire adult population of the U.S. on smartphones now. I think this means we can no longer ignore the fact that they exist. Uh, just so you can see the world uh, use of smartphones, this is a graph of the world smartphone adoption from 2007 to 2018. You can see it kind of starts to level out there at the top. That's actually happening in the U.S. as well. Uh, which is why companies are getting a little bit more aggressive about going after um, third world markets for smartphones. I just wanted to point out at the bottom of this graph, the launch of the iPhone is the first bar on that graph, and the launch of Android is the second bar on that graph. That's how fast we went to uh, a complete adoption, um, very fast. Uh, just in case you weren't aware, Android is actually the primary operating system of the world. Yes. Not... <laughs> Wow, never gotten that before. Not iPhone. <laughs> we tend to think of them as 50-50 in the U.S. because that is about the split in the U.S., but it's not on the world market. So I just thought I'd point that out. Um, this is some curves of technology adoption for U.S. households. There's some pretty fun ones on here. For example, um, the uh, electric power is that red uh, curve kind of towards the beginning of the graph that flattens out at the top. Um, the, the dishwasher is actually not at full adoption on this graph, if you can pick that one out. Um, the landline is at the one that's actually decreasing towards the end there. So there's an adoption that's now going away. Um, smartphones are actually not on this graph yet. Um, there's the refrigerator. That was actually a pretty fast one in terms of adoption curves. Um, there, there's the dishwasher, in case you didn't catch that. Not at full adoption in the U.S. Um, and then... Um, I wanted to show you now where smartphones fall. So that's smartphones on an adoption curve. 
That's how fast it happens. It's like basically a vertical line, for those of you who are math people. Okay, um, also social media follows almost the same adoption curve as smartphones, very, very steep. So uh, social media use has grown dramatically over the time period, the same time period as smartphone use for better or for worse. Uh, 18 to 29 year olds, 88% of them use some kind of social media, right? L less as you go down the generations. So those are the numbers, a little bit bigger so you can see them. Even senior citizens are now engaging in social media, uh, which is probably what's driving uh, teenagers off of things like Facebook. So the state of technology is, is rapidly changing. It has rapidly changed. To drive this home to you guys as educators, I thought I would walk you through the evolution of information in our lifetimes. So when I was an undergraduate, we had just started getting on the internet. We used stuff like Prodigy. Do you remember Prodigy and America Online? Okay. And so when I wanted information about the you know, career fields I was going into, chemistry, biology, math, I had basically two options. I could go to the library at the University of Montana, that's the picture on the left, or I could go to my textbooks or notes from class. And the reason we took notes in class was because that was a primary source of information for us. It wasn't like you could Google the things that you couldn't figure out, right? That wasn't there yet. When I was a PhD student, it had shifted a little bit. Now I could go to my computer and do some searching for my topics, but all of the world's information was just starting to be indexed on things like Wikipedia, so it was, that was just starting out. Um, you could go and search the library maybe from your you know, desk at home, but you were still tethered to whatever was actually physically connected to the internet, right? So it was still somewhat important to take good notes and have your textbooks laying around, and you all probably know now that the, the students today very rarely keep a textbook, right? They try to figure out every way possible to rent or not use it at all, borrow it from somebody else. Students today pretty much have two primary sources of information when they need something. They pick up their phone and they look for it on Google, or they have all sorts of sites they go to that are not their class site to try to find the information they're looking for. It's always amazing to me how often a student will not look in the LMS for the information that they need and will just primarily go somewhere else first. It's not natural to them to go to the LMS first as a source of information. I can see some of you nodding, so I guess, I'm guessing you've experienced this too. So that's all just to say that we now have ubiquitous information in our fingertips. This is a completely different world than it was 30 years ago. When some of us went to school 30 years ago, if we'd had Google, we would have used it too. Like who in their right mind would think, oh, well I can walk over to the library and search through the card catalog and stacks of books, which will take me about two hours, or I could pick up my phone and Google it. Oh yeah, I'm going to the library. I mean, nobody would have done that, right? It's completely natural that the people we teach now go to their phones as a source of information because this is the first time in human history we've had access to that. So one question I'll ask you here today is, how has your curriculum changed to account for the fact that we live in a world with ubiquitous information? Not how have you incorporated cell phone technology into your classrooms? I'm not asking that. How has your curriculum changed? How have your learning objectives changed? How have your course objectives changed? How have your programs changed? To account for the fact that even in the workforce, the search for information is ubiquitously done on your phone. Salespeople out in the field, this is what they use. Meetings happening at organizations, this is what they use. It is not uncommon to be in a business meeting and everybody has a phone out. And what are they doing? They're taking notes on their phone. They're doing things they shouldn't do on their phone just like everybody else. But you know, people were always daydreaming in meetings so that you know, isn't new. It's just a little bit more obvious now. 
Just to kind of finish this little point off, I thought I would show you a couple more graphs. I like graphs. You'll find that out later. Um, my husband just offered to get a tattoo of a graph if it would turn me on. Um, <laughs> really happened. Callie is a witness. <laughs> Anyways, I thought I would start with just human population growth. So this is a graph over a thousand years. Do you see how that happened? With human population growth, we have a couple other things happening. With more humans, we have more history. We have more data. We have more scientific discoveries. As we multiply the number of people, everything else multiplies. More novels, more poems, more of everything. There were only one billion of people on the planet 200 years ago. And now, how many? Seven billion in 2016? That's seven times the number of people creating information and creating uh, works, artifacts of humanity. In 2003, Eric Schmidt pointed out that every two days now we create as much information as we did from the dawn of civilization up to 2003. I'd actually argue a little bit with his wording. We create as much data, not as much information. But still, that's that, that was 2003, and it's much worse now. So this is the kind of data we create. This was a graph from 2017. Um, all in one minute of every day, this is how much data we create. Uh, so, for example, uh, users watch 4,146,000 YouTube videos in a minute, but only, uh, let's see, only 120 LinkedIn profiles are created, just in case you find that one funny. Maybe not. Okay, moving on. <laughs> just to show you in some context that might be more relevant to education, this is the number of U.S. fiction titles from 1940 to 2010. See that rise? a rise in population combined with a rise of ease of access combined with the rise of the internet. This is the number of new book titles published per year per one million inhabitants. This is actually for other countries other than the U.S., but you can see the same curves there. That last uh, 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 section of the graph is the last hundred years. So there are now more books published all the time than there were in the previous 2,000 years. This is a graph of the number of cited references in the sciences. And just for perspective, I thought I should point out this is a log graph. So for those of you who know what a log graph is, you take an exponential graph, and when you take a log of it, it should show up linear. If it shows up exponential after you take a log of it, it's like an exponential exponential graph. It's like growing faster than an exponential graph. So the number of citations are growing faster than an exponential graph. The number of medical studies also going up. This is all just to say that there's no way you can actually keep up. This is now the information, not the data, right? This is the when we take the data and turn it into information and insights. You can't keep up now. There's this kind of joke about a PhD program um, that says that, I think it's going to play here. Hopefully it's going to play. You imagine a circle of all human knowledge, and by the time you finish elementary school, you know a little bit. By the time you finish high school, you know a little bit more of that human knowledge. With a bachelor's degree, you gain a specialty in human knowledge. A master's degree pushes you out a little bit further towards the boundary of human knowledge. You read research papers, and that takes you to the very edge of human knowledge. You focus on that boundary very deeply, you push at it for a few years, usually banging your head against it, until one day the boundary gives away just slightly, and we call that a PhD. <laughs> just to make this clear, that boundary is now moving faster than you can get to it. So something has to change. We as humans cannot keep up with just the publications in that tiny little field of specialization anymore. Something has to change. So the state of technology is, is rapidly changing. Are, do we agree on that now? Yeah, things are different than they were 20 years ago. 
you can't, I'm probably preaching to the choir, but just in case there's somebody not in the choir listening to this, you can't just say, well, I learned it that way 20 years ago. That should be how you learn it today. There's too much information. And we have access to it all here. If we don't start adapting to that, our students are never going to survive in the world that we put them into. Okay, so the amount of data is also rapidly increasing. I think what this means for us is that we need to start emphasizing search and application over memorization because you couldn't memorize all the information in your field even if you tried. Now, this is, I am not saying there should be no memorization, okay? I want to make that clear. But maybe we should start being a little bit more selective. Maybe every class shouldn't have, you must know everything at 100% memorization. Because maybe that isn't reasonable in this world. Maybe it's more reasonable to learn how to find what you're looking for, assess whether it's accurate, and apply it to the problem that you're trying to solve. One thing that I uh, developed in the last few years to try to help us with this problem of what do you keep and what do you what do you get rid of and what do you change is a, a lens I call the ESOL lens. And it's something that you can use to look at your learning objectives and your course objectives through with kind of this critical perspective. It's four letters that, of course, stand for something because we're academics and we like to have um, acronyms. So E stands for existence, simply meaning uh, do you know it exists? Is that enough? You know what, what word to Google if it ever comes up in your life. Supported means that you can uh, do something with support. So, for example, a take-home assignment where you can look for tutorials on YouTube to help you. You can ask a friend. You can look at a textbook. Like, could you do this particular skill with support from the Internet? Independent would be something that you do want students to independently be able to do on their own without help. Like, for example, maybe you need them to know it to move on to the next class or the next level in their program. And then lifetime is a skill you, you want them to have forever. For example, like personally, I want all of my students to have information literacy skills forever, right? I want them to be able to look at uh, any piece of information, graph, data they find on the internet and be able to give it a reasonable evaluation for its accuracy and realness, right? Don't you want them to have that forever too? I hope. No. Okay. Well. Yes, okay. So um, I, I do have um, handouts on this scale that you can find on my website and, um, and links to it all over. Uh, if you just look up for the East, just look for the ESO lens on the internet and you'll find it. Um, just to kind of talk about the assessment of each of these, if you're looking at something that's just existence, students need to know it exists, you probably don't need to assess it at all. You can still have a learning objective on it, but you maybe just decide it's an E. So I'm going to mention it in class. I'm going to show them an example in class, but I'm not assessing it anymore. Supported means that you're going to do low stakes assessments, something like projects, take home assignments, group work, um, something where they can show that with support they can, they can replicate the technique because probably the technique is going to change by the time they hit the workforce. So what you need them to know is that they can go find the resources and replicate the technique. Um, independent, you would probably want multiple assessments, lots of formative, um, at least one kind of medium stakes or high stakes assessment. And then for the lifetime uh, goals that we have, you want to think about cumulative assessments in addition to the independent assessments. So when I look at uh, final exam questions now, I think about only those learning objectives that I want them to have for a lifetime, and I focus on that on the final. I figure if they've proved to me in several independent exams that there are several like chapter exams that they can do something, they've got independent down at least to get them to the next class when they use it again. But what I want to see on a final exam is those lifetime skills nailed absolutely 100%. So we're revisiting them again. Now, uh, one thing we should talk about here is why it's so important that right now we live in this time of rising information and uh, it is actually this rise in information that you see on all of these graphs that is the reason we're seeing so much buzz around AI. Now, for those of you who are my age or older, you've seen buzz about AI before, right? And you might be thinking to yourself, I've seen this before. It's not happening. 
but something's different now. What's different now is that we have all of this data that we didn't have before. And what does AI need to learn from? Data. Yeah, so there's actually two types of AI. There's the kind you might think of when somebody says AI. Uh, this is called uh, general intelligence. The other kind of AI is called artificial narrow intelligence. Now, narrow intelligence is pretty much what businesses are building into products and, and processes right now. And narrow intelligence has to have good data sets that are well labeled in order to learn from. Okay? Now, I'll give you one little hint. Learning data sets are an absolute mess and they're not well labeled and they don't have complete information. So the likelihood that somebody's gonna actually be able to build a learning project product that really does what human beings do when we assess all the different variables about students, I think is quite low. It would require general intelligence, I think. And the general belief is that general intelligence, amongst experts, the general belief is that general intelligence is at least 20 to 50 years out still. Narrow intelligence, however, is here to stay. So I thought we would talk about, you know, a comparison between automation, which I'm sure you've heard uh, has lost a lot of jobs in the world, and um, AI and that impact on the world. So how many jobs in the world do you think have been lost due to automation in millions? Like people who lost their jobs and never got another job due to automation. How many, how many millions? 20? 30? Remember the world population is 7 billion. 30 million people? Never got another job. Zero, they have different jobs now? Yeah, there's a trick to that question, you caught it. <laughs> it's actually not that big. It's about uh, 1.8 million, 1.7 million people in the world lost a job and didn't find something to replace it. And um, the majority of those were actually in, um, not in the United States, they were in China and and the 28 EU countries. So think about all of the, the angst that we've heard about in the news, about automation stealing jobs, automation stealing jobs. Automation did steal some good jobs. There's no doubt about that. Um, but most people did find something as a replacement, although it might not have been, I think, as, as good of a replacement. So here are the projected job disruptions due to AI. They're all over the place, so take them or leave them. Oxford thinks that 47% of American jobs are at high risk of automation. Up to 20 million manufacturing jobs worldwide lost to robots by 2030. McKenzie Global says that between 40 million and 160 million women worldwide will need to transition to a new occupation by 2030. That's because worldwide, women do a lot of secretarial oriented work. And as that work in other countries transitions to AI, they're gonna lose that work. Uh, we already went through that for the most part in the US, I think. Um, the World Economic Fund says that automation should displace you know, 75 million jobs but generate 133 million new ones. Again, like I said, take it or leave it. Forrester predicts job losses of 29% uh, with only 13% job creation to compensate. So all over the place. But it's going to have an impact one way or the other. One thing that a lot of the studies will talk about is that jobs that require repetitive, easy to teach skills will be disrupted first. That's the thing where we can have a large data set and well-labeled data, right? And that's what an AI system can learn from. Now the good news for that is that if you're really tired of grading things like grammar in writing, the AI systems will be able to grade grammar for you and already in fact do in many, in many programs, right? Um, but if you're you know, doing something deeper like the theme and the, the flow of the writing, it's gonna be harder to label that data set unless all the students answer the same question. So when you see, um, top, when you see a technology come out on things like the SAT and ACT essays being done by AI and you think, oh my gosh, all essays are gonna be graded by AI, the thing you have to catch there is that all the students write the same essays so they can take, you know, like, 100 essays or 1,000 essays, have humans grade those ones, because they're all the same question, and then feed that to an AI, and then the AI can grade the other 10,000, right? But if not all students are answering the same question, it doesn't work. You can't just hand a random question 
and a random set of essays to AI intelligence and have that work. Does that make sense? Okay, so there's really good questions to ask here if you're talking to technology vendors. I'm giving you the secret things to ask, right? Like, what does this really work on? When they tell you, oh yeah, AI will do grading for you. What does it really work on? Tell me the actual parameters. So um, there are a lot of jobs listed as 100% as automatable jobs. Um, some have probably already become automated, like motion picture projectionists. I'm guessing a lot of those are already automated. And we've seen this happen before with uh, the rise of robots and factories and things like that. But the vast majority of jobs consist of some portion of tasks that can be probably automated by AI. So what this means is 10 years from now, our jobs will look different. Some of what we do today will be automatically done by AI. Let's hope it's email, shall we? <laughs> I mean, you've seen that email is already starting to formulate responses for you. And you probably thought it was creepy at first, but now you're like, yeah, yeah, that's what I want to say. <laughs> right? So at some point in the future, we'll just be sending emails automatically back and forth. It'll be our my AI talking to your AI until the conversation's over. Right? <laughs> this could work in our advantage. Maybe your school can train the AI email responses to be biased in a particular manner. Like, I like change. I like change. Let's do more of it, right? And then you can be like, your email said. Okay, anyways. So we're going to be retraining all the time. As, these, as some of our tasks move away, I doubt we're going to have less work because that never happens, right? We've seen that now in the U.S. The more automated we become, the more work we have to do. I don't know how that happens. but uh, So we're going to be retraining all the time. And our students are going to be retraining all the time on the job. What you teach them to do today, they may not do at all all five years from now in that workplace. We've got to start teaching something different in our curriculum, right? We've got to. We've got to train, we've got to train for like real skills, thinking skills, creative skills, like the things we keep talking about, but then still feed them memorization, right? I thought at this point in the presentation, you might need kittens. Especially because that wasn't the only driver of change. <laughs> so I looked at drivers of change from several different organizations and kind of accumulated them all on one slide. And artificial intelligence is just one. Just one driver of change in the world. I like the one in the upper right corner, superstructured organizations. We have these enormous, super structured business organizations now. Companies like Amazon, Google, Western Governors University is a super structured organization. Um, Starbucks is a super structured organization. Our students are going to go out and work in these super structured organizations where there are like a hundred layers of management between the bottom person and the top person because no manager is supposed to manage more than like five people theoretically in business. And you know, if you're going to have an organization of 10,000 employees, you can just kind of start doing the math and you realize you've got to have, you may never move up in the organization because they add managers faster than you can move up, right? How many of us are training our employees to deal with working in one of these superstructures? Like, how do you get seen in a superstructure? How do you get your point across? How do you work towards a promotion? How do you get the right training, right? If I, if I was teaching business classes, you, you would want to be teaching about this, and yet I don't think it's even made it into the textbooks yet, or the OER, right? All of these things need to be addressed in the curriculum that we are now developing, or maybe redeveloping. I just kind of did an experiment with myself. You know, what have I had to learn since leaving school? If you want to take a moment and reflect on what you've had to learn since leaving school. Everything somebody said. <laughs> and it's a good thing that you were trained to think in school, right? And to learn new things. Just think about all the times you've heard from a faculty member, I just can't learn how to use technology. I'm sorry, but it's our job to teach students to learn how to learn. You don't get to say, I can't learn that, right? And that's, I think, the appropriate response to that kind of comment. 
It is our job to teach students to learn how to learn. You don't get to say, I don't know how to learn. So these are the things I learned in the past three years. I started a company three years ago, um, and I actually do have an MBA, but it's like 16, 17 years old. And so I had to learn how to use all sorts of new programs, uh, all sorts of new things about pitching to VC. And um, you know, I think I have about 300 logins to different pieces of software that we use as part of just doing business in the world. And I suspect most of the pieces of software that we use aren't taught in business programs. And you know, I'm not sure they should be because they change so fast. I don't know how you'd pick one. But the general principles should probably be taught. What is a customer relationship management system, for example? You probably use one on campus to deal with your students on the student side, and you may not realize it. Anyways, OK, so now we have three problems. All right, the state of technology is rapidly changing. The amount of data is rapidly increasing, and careers are rapidly changing. I think that curriculum in higher education has got to change to the actual curriculum. Now, we go through two problems in um, curriculum change. One I call curriculum drift, which is that you know, when we design curriculum, we all know we do it perfectly, right? It's beautiful. It's like aligned well. We have all the right topics because we spent three years developing it, right? And so it's like that original curriculum column. But over time, the curriculum drifts because the world drifts, right? We add stuff to the curriculum, and very rarely do we remember to remove stuff from the curriculum as we add it. We just somehow talk faster and faster and faster, get more stuff in, do more assignments, and it all works out, right? No. <laughs> we also have curriculum bloat on top of curriculum drift. Now, curriculum bloat is what happens to our resources as we realize that more should be in there. And what typically happens when you're using a textbook or OER or something like that, um, people from all over the country weigh in and say, I'm not using this unless you add the, these problems or you add these discussion questions or you add this topic. Or... And so what happens is those resources that you started with start to bloat over time and get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger from the inside without even considering the new topics that just have to be added from new developments in the world. And so you end up with this kind of curriculum reality that is both drift and bloat. So what you, you, what you originally planned to teach is now at least twice as big as what you planned. And then somebody like me comes and says, you really need to change what you're teaching. And you think, I already can't teach what's there. Come on, right? Like, there's no space. There will only be space if you actually take the time to review the curriculum and decide what doesn't need to be there anymore. That is the only option. OK, it's not the only option. You could double the number of years it takes to get degrees. But I don't really think that that's an option. So our only choice is to actually look at the curriculum that's there and carefully choose. And that's one of the reasons I developed that ESOL lens, is so that you have some way of kind of thinking about what that choice is. But also, the very smart selection of things like course objectives helps you to make your choices for what stays and what goes. You shouldn't be teaching any learning objectives in a course if it's not an actual objective of the course or the program. If you do the work, of removing some stuff, then what you can create is some white space in your curriculum. That white space makes some, we call this at Course Tune, condoing your curriculum. If you can make some white space in your curriculum, then you have space to grow into these new things that you should be spending more time on or, or teaching more deeply. Teaching how to apply takes more time than teaching how to memorize. You need to do more examples, more practice, right? And that's, that's what our students need. Creativity takes more time. So you have to make the white space in the curriculum. That's hard work. It's not easy. It involves a lot of conversations. Sometimes they're not so pleasant. Um, but there are smart ways to go about doing these things. And I think, I think um, the people in this room, for sure, are the ones who probably start a lot of those conversations. 
and then come running back here year after year to get kind of built back up after those happen. <laughs> So we, we have this issue, I think, now that expertise is becoming a moving target as well, right? That's the careers rapidly changing part. And so curriculum also needs, we, we first need to fix the curriculum we have, but we also need to leave that space in the curriculum or a strategy in the curriculum to be able to morph quickly as the world changes. So how do we do that? How do we make a curriculum that both gets approved and can morph <laughs> uh, rapidly as the world changes? And I think there are some strategies that we can use. So I'm going to share a couple of them with you. Um, one way we can do it is to create uh, what I would call like a core and a theme um, to courses. So for example, English composition, um, you know, we teach a lot of, uh, of the stuff you see on the screen in English composition. Um, but to write, how to analyze grammar, or spelling, we kind of reiterate those things in, in English composition, uh, critical thinking, reading strategies, et cetera. And that's, I think at most schools, a three credit course. Let's just assume it's a three credit course. Um, well, what we could do is break it up into a two credit course with a one credit theme. So for example, if that two credits could be the kind of stuff that would be common across all themes, English department, you know, takes ownership of that, owns it, structures it. And then the one credit add-on could always be online. So that's very easy to fit into schedules. And so if I was going to do it with a business theme, I would just take some of the things that normally happen in English and do them in a business context. So I would read marketing reports and HR reports and things like that, the Harvard Business Review, as my documents to read and analyze. I would learn how to write better emails, reports, and memos. I would uh, do my critical thinking around constructing persuasive arguments, the things that you do in business meetings all the time, right? If I was going to change this to have a medical theme, notice that the first two columns of jigsaw pieces don't change. That's still the core English, right? But now your one credit online add-on, you read medical journals and health histories, you write health histories and insurance letters, because that's a real thing in the medical field, right? And you, uh, for critical thinking, you do especially attention to detail, because that's so important in medicine, getting the details right, right? More important than it is probably in any other uh, subject area. You could do it with science, right? No reason you couldn't. What do you read? Science journals, right? Science articles, science journals, tech articles. What do you do for writing? You write scientific writing. Right? And what do you do for critical thinking? You work specifically on hypotheses and conclusions. How do I write a hypothesis, smart one? How do I summarize an article and write a conclusion or summarize a lab report and write a conclusion? This is stuff we have a really hard time training students to do in the sciences. It would be great if they could actually learn that skill in their English classes. So you have this core that sits there and is the kind of official approved part of the course. And then you know what will always go into your one credit theme. You know it'll always have a reading component, it'll always have a writing component, and it will always have a critical thinking component. The context is the thing that changes on that, right? And if you do that theme as an add-on online, then whether it's face-to-face -face classes or online classes, I know you guys are all online classes, but it would even work on face-to-face -face classes. They might do their English core face-to-face, -face, do their theme online, right? English faculty can still be involved in grading and assessing the work of those students, but there may also be a, a, a subject matter expert who helps with the construction of that theme, right? Making sure that the, the assessments are realistic and the reading examples are realistic. So that's one way we can rapidly morph our curriculum according to what's happening. Um, so I just thought I'd give you a second here to think about this. If a student wanted to do English composition with an entertainment theme, uh, maybe talk with a person sitting next to you for a second. What would you have them read? What would you have them write? How would you have them think critically? Go.
Okay. We'll do the clap clap. Do you guys know that one? I clap twice, then you clap twice. Ready? Okay. Doesn't work with you guys? Nonconformists. So somebody give me an example. What could you have them read? What what was that? Theater reviews. Great idea. Watch movie scripts. They could read movie scripts, right? Screenplays. Like, doesn't this sound like a fun class? Okay, and what could they write? They could write screenplays or they could write dialogue. Writing dialogue turns out to be something we need more people who can do. Because simulations, like all these computer simulations, the reason that they're kind of lame right now is because we don't have people who can write dialogue, writing the dialogue for them, right? You need people who can think creatively to write the dialogue for good simulation, good learning simulations. Um, and then critical thinking, what could we do there? write their own interpretation. There is something called script analysis that uh, actors do, like looking at a script and trying to interpret the, the, um, how, how it actually uh, runs. Um, any other ideas for critical thinking? Where is it going? Okay. Uh, you could look at different perspectives on the same play, right, as a critical thinking exercise, things like that. Yeah. Now, you might think to yourself, well, like, Aren't we forcing students to make decisions too early about like what they might be interested in? But I actually look at it the opposite way. We've learned in the education community that you want students to student teach as fast as possible if they think they want an education degree, right? Why do you do that? Because you don't want them to go through four years, get into the classroom, and then discover they hate it. So I actually think having one credit themes to courses, whether it be English or math or science, is a great idea because it exposes them to the work they think they want to do early. If somebody who thinks they want to be a theater major goes into this English class and discovers they really hate screenplay work, they just learn something about their potential career, right? And that might cause them to explore a different theme the next semester. I think that's a great idea. There's actually something now called a neo-generalist, which is um, somebody who deeply learns multiple disciplines. And I think this is actually the kind of thinking that we need in a world with AI, that the most highly sought after workers are gonna be the ones who don't just know one field deeply. Because the problem with knowing one field deeply is so will the AI. <laughs> <laughs> the most sought after workers, we think, will be the ones who actually can think across disciplines, right? And so learning bits of disciplines will actually help you to think creatively in whatever field you go into. So I think we should stop teaching these general courses and really let people dive into themes um, as a way to, to make it more interesting and to widen their perspectives a little bit. So another thing I think we can do, uh, getting at this new generalist theme as well, is we could just start teaching something that looks very different than how we set up a degree program today. And what I mean by that is today we have these kind of siloed subjects and you collect siloed subjects into what we call like an associate's degree. And then we specialize and call that a bachelor's degree. So I'm, I'm thinking here mostly about the associate's degree, okay? So rather than, than collecting your math, English, science, humanities, et cetera, what if we just collected that in a different way and we stacked it in a different way? So let me follow, follow me on this and see what you think. For example, let's call these pods. Let's say that you can take a pod each semester. And uh, so you take a collection of courses each semester. That's the pod. The pod is basically scheduled so you can take it all at once, right? So pod number one maybe that you decide to take is called being human. And you learn about the science of being human, like the psychology, the neuroscience. You learn about the meaning of consciousness and just like do the, read the, the papers and talk about the philosophers, uh, the meaning of consciousness. You do some biology on the stages of life and, and um, behavioral analysis and the stages of life. You learn about the psychology of human interactions. That might be your sociology and anthropology. And you talk about the interactions between humans and technology. So you essentially take maybe uh, five courses that semester, all around being human, but it's teaching you some writing, some philosophy, some humanities, some science, some, some math maybe, right? And so you immerse yourself that semester in what is it to be human 
from all of these different perspectives. And then you go to the next semester, you choose a different pod. So your college might offer like 10 pods. You choose the ones you want. So next semester, you decide you're going to take a pod called Planet Earth. And in Planet Earth, you learn about environmental science. You learn about conscious capitalism, um, waste and recycling management, trend analysis uh, to make predictions about the world, energy. There's your science, right? And then maybe cultural perspectives on Planet Earth from different views around the world, right? So again, you can see you would have a little bit of everything in there, right? And then you, you basically stack a certain number of pods for an associate's degree. So you basically, your school basically says like, okay, a pod will always have a writing, so say a pod is uh, 15 credits, you know, a pod will have approximately, you know, this many credits of writing, this many credits of science, this many credits of humanities, this many credits of elective, this many credits of you, know, you, you re-establish your associate's degree in a different way, right? And then all you have to do to graduate is stack pods. So if you complete four pods, you have an associate's degree because every pod was well-balanced, right? And so at the end, you have an associate's degree. What this does is it allows somebody to come and take a pod, right? So if you take a pod, it might be the pod that actually helps you to get a new job or to get a new position at your company or to go into a new field. Like maybe you really want to get into solar panels. So you go to the community college and you take the planet Earth pod and you learn all about things related to, to sustainability and energy. And you can use that to pitch yourself as an employee, a salesman or something to a, a solar panel company. You might not go back to work on your associates again for four years and maybe in four years you're like, oh, now I need, now I need something related to artificial intelligence. So I'm gonna take that pod now, right? And so that gives people the flexibility to kind of come and go and know that whichever pods they stack together, they will eventually have that degree. And it's not by taking the silo courses. It's about learning about the world with every pod you take, right? And I think for a lot of folks, this would be a really sexy option because it's not just high school again. Think about how disappointing it must be to go to college and then realize when you get there that you are just taking high school again. You have a math class, you have an English class, you have a humanities class, you have a science class. None of the teachers talk to each other. There's no common theme between them, right? You're kind of just in high school again. That's so sad. Like, we want college to be this transformational experience, right? We keep talking about college as being a transformational experience, but we aren't making it that. We need to focus on something else to get the transformational experience and get the learning through that. So I think that curriculum in, in higher ed has to change. Um, we need to make space for innovation. That means we, gotta, we really got to clean it out. Uh, we've got to carve out room uh, in our standard courses for some kind of specialties or co-requisites. Uh, we need to think about quicker paths to getting students something that helps them in their careers, whether it's a certificate, a pod, something that, that really moves them on. And then we just need to think about this in terms of retraining because people are going to have to keep getting education over their lifetime. So how do we do that well? We are now kind of in a time where we simultaneously live in awe of technology and in fear of technology. A, a great example of this is um, self-driving cars. There is a great little experiment on the internet where you can um, decide if you were the algorithm for a self-driving car, which accident you would have if given the choice. Would you go left or go right? You know, it's kind of like this. If you go left, you'll kill these people. If you go right, you kill this, these people. Which decision would you make, right? And it starts out really easy and you're like, oh yeah, yeah, I would do this, right? Like, it's like a dog versus a human and you're like, all right, well, I guess I'm saving the human. Like, you can make like some, some no, he says no. <laughs> It's not your dog, it's just a dog. Um, <laughs> and it gets progressively harder to the point where you realize that you can't, you can't come up with any strategy to sanely make these decisions, right? And that's gonna happen when we have things like self-driving cars. We're gonna have to program algorithms that make these decisions about like, well, hopefully you never have to make the decision, do you kill these people or these people? But if you had to, what would you do, right? But the truth is that self-driving cars could save the lives of millions and millions of people every year 
because we just wouldn't have the human-caused accidents anymore. We would only have the machine-caused accidents. And the machine-caused accidents are likely to be at a much, much lower rate. So we will have to reach a point in humanity where we decide that we're willing to live with the accidents caused by the machines in order to save all the accidents caused by us. And that's going to be a really hard tipping point. But ethically, if you knew that you could save two million lives, and the only downside would be that we would lose 10 people because a machine made a mistake, would you do it? Oh, yeah. That's the kind of like philosophical thinking we need to be working with students on. So that's like awesome technology, right? If we could save millions and millions of lives, if your kids never had to be with a teenager driving their car that they were in, like, wouldn't that be a great thing if you could kind of guarantee like 99.9999% safety? So that's amazing, but it's also scary, right? So these are just some fun quotes from the educational industry. I'm sure you've seen them. Uh, 50 years, there will be only 10 institutions in the world delivering higher education. I'm the founder of Udacity in 2012. We think of it like a robot tutor in the sky that can semi-read your mind and figure out what your strengths and weaknesses are down to the percentile. As the founder of Newton in 2015. And then this is a kind of a famous oldie. Anyone that can be replaced by a computer should be. This, this one's actually happening, and it has been happening for 50 years, right? Because if a computer can do the task, why not let it and you go do the things that make you human, right? It's not fun to do the things that computers do. We don't like to do the things that computers do for the most part. <clears throat> I want to leave you with uh, one question that I think you should always ask yourself, and, and one question that I would pass along to the people you work with that I think you should always ask yourself when you're designing a course or teaching a course. If a student was to go to your institution for one semester, and they take a full load of classes, and they, they are successful, they pass all of those classes, they accumulate the debt associated with those classes, would they have learned something in every class that will actually help them right now in the world? Because shouldn't they? They should. And I think a lot of the anger around things like student loans right now is legitimately because there are just some really bad practices but also because a lot of folks have taken a class where they took the class, they paid for it, and they didn't they didn't get anything of use in their real life out of the class. They didn't see the connection. And I think that's on us to either make sure they see the connection to what they're going to use it for in their life. Because it might be abstract, but we just need to shine some light on it, right? Or we just need to make sure we're fitting better with what they're going to use. It doesn't need to be in their career. It could be in their family life. It could be in their personal life, right? But they need to feel like they, they grew as a person because they took that class. And I think too much right now we're treating it as a commodity and not that transformation that we, want, we, we really want to see. So look at each course that you design, supervise, or teach through that lens of does a student who takes this course is successful and never comes back, have they gotten something from this experience? Have they grown as a person? So I named this talk, um, what did I name this talk? <laughs> I think I'm going to find out in a second. Facing the future. <laughs> somebody, somebody gave me this lunchbox a long time ago because I was a big X-Files fan. And it says fight the future on it. So I think, I think what we actually need to do is face the future. right? We need to go in head on and stop ignoring it. We are there. We are already living in a future we haven't prepared for yet. And so that's what we need to do. Thank you. Okay, so who has the first question for Maria? 10 minutes for questions. Yes. Yeah, turn the little button. Yep. Okay. Uh, excuse me, I'm a little under the weather, so I hate to sound so raspy. As long as it's not coronavirus. Oh. 
Um, just going back to your, your conversation with uh, the ubiquitousness of, of smartphones yeah. and students using them. And I hope this, not to sound too much like a librarian because I'm a librarian uh, at a community college. And um, I think it's not so much that we're opposed to that. We want to work with that. We yeah. love the fact that students can access information at all times. And it just goes back to what you're saying about memorization. I think that's very archaic to have students memorize anything, especially in a history course or whatnot. Uh, you want to get them to think critically, look at other perspectives. But I think some of the, the qualms about this is not that they're accessing information, they're accessing it quickly. And you had mentioned the search, access, and uh, apply. But one important aspect of that is evaluate. Absolutely. And they're not evaluating it. Um, I they, agree. Sometimes even re we know research takes time. And they love the fact that that information is instantaneous. Um, so it's a matter of, I think, my personal opinion, understanding that they're going to use that smartphone, but at the same time training them that they need to evaluate that information, sometimes look a little longer, and, and realize that there's other viewpoints out there. Yeah, so I agree. I, when I totally I, agree. When I say we should teach them how to search, I mean we should teach them how to search the way you just described it. Yes. And right? I, and, and, and so I think that's a point well taken. And I always ask my students, where did you get that information from? In my head, I'm, I'm expecting them to say New York Times, Science Direct. The internet. Yeah. They view the internet as a source where it's yeah. a container of multiple sources, obviously, but I think that's just another pattern that we need to work with when we're trying to you know, adapt technology yeah. into our curriculum. I think, if, if, has anyone here seen Mike Caulfield's work on um, information literacy and search? It's a really smart body of work um, that they've done, they've done research, um, his group has done research on how do you actually get, get uh, literacy around search to stick, right? Like, like, I looked at it and I actually evaluated whether it was true or not. And so they have a new process they've developed that they, um, they've found has pretty good efficacy with students, with it sticking with students, like how to know if your information is good, how to evaluate it. Uh, it's really great stuff. And he's been actually using that search process uh, related to the coronavirus. And so every, every day he's posting new tweets about, like, you know, here's things you can use in your classes and, and whatnot Can related to. Yeah, I think I think it is the the crap test. It's an acronym, yeah. <laughs> of course, but it's a little different than the acronym a lot of students have been taught. His research showed that the acronym they'd been taught um, didn't actually do anything. Uh, so he kind of developed a new process. So I'd, I'd look at that stuff. That's really, uh, and I'm sure that um, Alex is already sharing it in the document right. for you. <laughs> yeah. I, I was so. Um... I was validated when, toward the end of your talk, you said to make sure that students um, learn something that will be helpful in the world rather than in their career. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I work with a lot of uh, um, humanities professors, and, you know, that's the ongoing angst is, you know, everybody's so career-driven right now. And, uh, you know, being able to expand that to say, well, you know, we all live in, a, in the same world, and... You know, whether you're able to do your specific job or not is also contingent upon being able to make good decisions within society to make sure that you have a job. Yeah, so I think that goes back to, one, making it transparent what somebody is learning, right? Not just that you're learning the humanities, but that we see patterns of behavior over time, right? Or that we see patterns of history over time or patterns of culture over time. And how do we see that in the world today, right? That's how you connect the old with the new, right? I actually just read this morning that University of Alaska has officially uh, slated creative writing, anthropology, um, sociology, and there was one other on that list. I don't remember what, it was another kind of um, <coughs> humanities oriented subject for deletion as programs at the university. I think that's actually the exact wrong thing to do. I think that a lot of these programs need to be re-envisioned and that uh, somebody needs to work with the faculty to put them in the perspective of something like pods, right? Where, where the connection to the world is very well seen um, because it's connecting to a theme that runs across everything, right? If we don't put that theme in there, it is really difficult to understand how a computer science major might need humanities or sociology. But the only thing that's left after AI takes over a lot of these tasks is that we're still human. 
that's the stuff that actually is important for us to still learn, right? But I don't think we're making, we're not making that message clear enough. And it's because of all the silos, I think, that we're not making it clear enough. I'm not claiming it's going to be easy work to do to create something like pod-based learning, but I absolutely think it's what we have to do. Question. We're just hitting the front row. Let's go to the back row, and then I'll go to this side. Back row. Okay. I'll rephrase it when you're done. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to summarize this for the online audience. <laughs> um, I think it's just the idea that, you know, a lot of times when we talk to professors in these fields, they don't want to see themselves as training people for the workplace, so they can't articulate that. But there's no reason why you can't uh, do both teach the thing you love and and help students to understand its its perspective in the world. So your example was philosophy, uh, that you know you can pitch it to an employer as I know how to uh, look at multiple perspectives for an idea, right? That's the kind of transparency I think we need, and that happens through good course objectives, actually, right? I, kn I know you're going to think I'm like a real nerd now, but I see the work that my company does, we see curriculum from all over the country, that hundreds of schools. Good course objectives are not topic oriented. Good course objectives are skills oriented. So learning about parabolas is not a good course objective. Learning how to relate graphs to equations is a good course objective. I mean, re-wordsmith it so that it's not using the word learning. Applying, right, yeah, I mean, you know what I'm saying, right? And so I think a lot of times in, in courses like humanities and sociology and anthropology, the problem is that the course objectives are written around topics and not around the skills. So if the course objective was around um, being able to uh, discuss multiple perspectives for something, then the learning objectives that sit underneath that can be about all the topics that would go into that, right? The objective of the course is about multiple, one of them is about multiple perspectives. Do you see the difference? So if you frame the course objectives aiming at the skills you want students to have, this can be job skills, world skills, citizenship skills, whatever, the individual topic-oriented stuff sits underneath them in the learning objectives. And now you're basically shifting the perspective of the course to training for those skills, critical thinking, analysis, those things, in the framework of what you teach. Does that make sense? And I think that's what we've actually got wrong in a lot of our um, curriculum documents, is that they're framed around specific topics. And so we go into those courses and think, oh, I'm supposed to teach these five topics, and not, I need to really nail these skills, right? That's my nerdy perspective on it. OK, somebody from over here? Any questions from the right side of the room? The right side of the room is quiet. OK. Are we out of time? No. No? OK. Well, there was a, um, a question online. Erin, do you want to ask her? So um, um, how would you recommend implementing the pod-based structure of curricula actually working with existing not as cool programs and curricula. <laughs> existing not as cool programs and curricula. Um, I kind of think that, okay, so I do actually know one way to do it. We experimented at the college I taught at years ago. So this is probably like 15 years ago. 15? No, maybe 12 years ago. 
we chose a theme for each semester. And then everybody just incorporated that theme into their, their stuff, right? So that's one fast way to do it, like right away. Like you could say, the theme for this semester is pandemics. In English class, you might read, read essays that were written during times of the plague. Uh, in history, you might study the time, <laughs> past times when we've had uh, Ebola in Africa or plagues in Europe. Um, you might talk about uh, Native Americans' uh, struggle with a disease being brought to the United States, right? There, you, in math, you could look at all the trends, <laughs> the, all the graphs, right? Like, so you pick a theme and, and you say, like, if you want to do it cleverly, you make it an opt-in theme with some kind of special bonus structure if you do it, right? Where faculty can choose to opt in or not. If enough faculty opt in, you'll start to hear students saying, oh yeah, we talked about that in my blah, blah, blah class. They're now tying things together, right, around that theme because they see all the different pieces of it together, right? So you can kind of make every semester a pod if you choose a theme for every semester. And you can pretty much, if you, you find good themes, even something like space travel could be a theme for a semester, right? In English, you read science fiction and you uh, talk about uh, energy for space travel and science classes. And, you know, there's... There's all sorts of stuff you can do once you pick a theme and start thinking about it, right? So I think that's one way that you could smartly implement it with your existing classes, and it would still be more interesting for students. Was there another question over here in the back? I thought I saw. Any other questions from Maria across the room? All right, then. Okay, thank you very much, Maria. Okay, so we are now scheduled for a 15 minute break. Um, I want to make sure that everyone during this 15 minutes goes to the Unsession um, uh, webpage. Uh, let me see if I can pull it up. Um, uh, oh, I don't know what, it, what the link is. So I think it's this one. So here it is. Um, so w if you would please go to this link during the break and put your name, your institution, any links or a description of what you would like to share. And then when we come back in 15 minutes, we will um, we'll do our own session. So everyone comes up and gets 15 minutes to talk or share about something cool that they're doing on their campus or something that you have that you would like us to know about and share. It can be anything uh, that you like. Um, so uh, check that uh, Google Doc out and, and we'll be back in 15 minutes. Thanks. Thank you, Maria.